Yeah, so hi, I'm Zolta. I will give you a short introduction just in a minute. Uh, but I'd like to poll you a bit. First of all, uh, there was a meetup uh, I went to. It was in uh, March, I guess. It was about structured streaming. Is there anyone who went to that meetup? Gonna get raise of hands? Okay, a few, a few. Thanks. It's like four people. Okay, and just to you know, kind of um, tune tune my talk. So, how many of you have any experience with Spark? Like anything? Okay, so that's like. 40%, I guess. Uh, and with, let's say, how many of you know like how decision trees work like intuitively? Can I get a raise of hands? OK, that's again like 40%. OK, then I will just very, very quickly introduce these concepts. So uh, I already told you that at the structure streaming meetup, but the, the main reason we are coming to Austria is actually labor case. <laughs> And I'm, I'm not joking. Uh, my hometown is, uh, is just at the border with Chopron. So every time I come home with my wife, um, even in the past, uh, when I used to live in Budapest, we always cross the border to find the nearest villa because it's, it's, it's really great. Uh, and you know what's the thing going back like to, to Budapest? Now it starts to become a thing in Budapest. You get it in like in a very fancy plate, and it's like with some side stuff. It's very expensive, like five, four or five euros, and uh, it's not as cool as what you get in the villa. <laughs> now, anyhow, if you ever go to Budapest, yeah, try it out. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is extra. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, about me, real quick. Uh, yeah, I work with Data Power. Basically, Mati and I are the core members, and we have a bunch of contactors uh, working uh, when needed. Uh, and uh, the biggest client of DataPile is Databricks. Those are the guys who, uh, who founded Spark, Apache Spark. So uh, we are, when it comes to training, we pretty much represent the, the Databricks organization. So uh, earlier, I worked for RapidMiner, Mate just told that. And then uh, I spent a lot of time at Prezi. Uh, I, I started quite early there working on the data infrastructure, then transform it into a big data infrastructure. And then, uh, then the managing the data engineering um, efforts of Prezi as it grew. And uh, there, was, there was one thing that, uh, that just hit my ear uh, where when Mate said that Prezi was so proud of failures. So my career at Prezi went that, first of all, I was the only data engineer. And then we were like two. And then we found out that we need a tech lead. So I became a tech lead. And then I failed big time. And then the other guy became the tech lead. And then, uh, as we went on, I became like tech lead manager again, and then engineering manager, and then engineering manager. So uh, that was kind of a bump there. So one time, the, uh, we always had these meetings. These were called show and tells. I think now they are called like all hands meeting when you give presentation to the whole company. So Prezi was already like, at that time, I think, uh, 1,800 people. So this our CDO came up to me uh, one time, and he just said, Hey, Zotia, I think you should go to the old hands meeting and just, uh, just give a presentation to everyone, like how to fuck it up as a tech lead. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I told them I'm not too comfortable with that in front of 100 people. <laughs> All right, so yeah, that's about Prezi. Uh, yeah, so Matty already told you about data power. I don't want to like uh, do a shameless plug. We do trainings and consultancy, mostly for international clients. Uh, and we are a fully remote comp a company internally. So now these are the guys who, who, uh, who, who we work with. So that's actually me at the border. That's also, uh, I'm very happy to be here because you know I just moved here actually like to move back like a few weeks ago uh, from Budapest. So. That's about the company. I also do a few things. And it's not about like t telling a lot about me or just bragging about anything. Uh, but I just want to list you this, because the whole idea with, uh, with Murray and Wolf came about like how we can cooperate uh, here in the region. So uh, we are in a pretty good position with these three institutes and also the companies that Matt listed. So if you are you know, up to you, you need to reach someone or you you just want to have a chat with someone, then just reach out. Uh, so yeah, so one is the Budapest Data Science Meetup, and the other one uh, is Crunch Conference. Uh, I kicked off Crunch Conference like t 
uh, three years ago, and we work in a democratic way, which means like the main organizer is always someone else every year. So um, I'm still on an organizing. And I teach at the Central European University uh, that uh, this pretty interesting, uh, like here in Vienna, it has some uh, uh, Viennese relations because uh, the Central European University, I'm not sure if you know that. Can I get a raise of hands if you ever heard about it? Okay, it's, it's a few people. So this is an American independent university and it's uh, founded by George Soros. Uh, you know the guy like the philanthrope or evil, it really depends <laughs> what your stake on conspiracy theories are. <laughs> uh, so in the current political situation in Hungary, that's not a good place to be, like being affiliated with George Soros. So uh, it's not sure if CEU will stay in Hungary or not, but uh, they are in the discussion with uh, uh, Christian Kern. So he actually reached out to invite the CEU in Vienna. So perhaps in a few years that will be a university in Vienna, which I think would be like horrible for Hungary, but good for Vienna because that's the only university which is ranked globally top 100 in the region. So yeah, so uh, that's about CEU. Okay, the last slide. Uh, in my free time, what I, I like to do, I like to take photos of every street uh, like this. And uh, I run an Instagram about it. It's called Every Street. So feel, free to, feel free to follow. Uh, okay, so let's go for the demo. Now, the demo uh, will be machine learning on Spark. And you can, if you're coming to the cafe tomorrow, then we will distribute notebooks for you, and this demo will be in your notebooks. If you are not coming to the cafe tomorrow, then uh, feel free to, uh, I don't know, mention us on Twitter or just send an email at hello at datapower.com, and then we can send you this notebook with some instructions how you can, how you can set up your own account and then uh, start playing with that for free. Uh, yeah, just give me one sec. Let's need a sip of water, and then we can get started with the actual demo. Okay, I will not tell too much about the environment and I'm certainly not here uh, today to sell you Databricks. Well, this is a Databricks environment, so the, this is the environment that the guys created who, uh, who founded Fark, uh, Spark. And this is a notebook environment. And the good thing is, and that's why we use it here, because you get a free cluster, a free like small cluster. Uh, once again, if you shoot us an email, we can send you some instructions how you can set everything up for free for yourself. So that's why we use that. It's very easy. It just needs a browser. Uh, this whole environment is like a Zeppelin notebook or an IPython notebook with a cluster. So the notebook that you will see here today is largely based on one of the uh, demo notebooks from Databricks. And uh, we did some improvements and modifications on them. So now we can go through it. So let me just make it a bit bigger. So hopefully that's uh, big enough. Yeah, if you ever want to work with it, uh, that's the good thing is that there is a lot of text. So we can really send this to you. OK, so this is Spark. And for those of you who haven't worked with Spark, well, a few things. Let me just go and open up two web pages. One is, one is the Spark, Spark Apache org. Because there is a lot of confusion about Spark because there is a lot of uh, uh, hype about Spark. So what Spark says is that it is a fast and general engine for large-scale data processing. And I think this is it. It's really a great tool. And it's for data processing. It's not a database. It doesn't store data. You got to have your own database or file system or whatever. Uh, but Spark is good in providing a unified layer for data processing. If you want to do classic analytics or SQL or whatever in, uh, uh, in data and on a lot of data, then, then it's a great tool. One of the great things that you won't see here in this demo is that Spark doesn't care if you read from a CSV file or a NoSQL database or a database or some Parquet file or whatever because, uh, because, yeah, you have a unified interface. So Spark works out the rest. So that's, that's really good. Uh, yeah, what else? Oh, yeah, th there is this chart. Take it with a pinch of salt 
or I would say like take it with a ton of salt. It says the spark is like 120 times quicker than Hadoop. Of course, if you see such a chart, then you, first of all, you don't believe it. Uh, so yeah, so this is about spark, but it is better than, than a classic Hadoop map. It's way better, but this chart is it's a bit biased, I believe. Uh, OK, so the other thing that Mate mentioned is this guy called, this Los Angeles guy called Sirart, he, Sirart GitHub. Let's see. OK, this is, this is the thing that Mate talked about. And I think it's, it's, it's good for a disclaimer. This is the guy who makes benchmarks about different machine learning solutions. And he became pretty, uh, pretty uh, famous in the, in the classic Silicon Valley tech field. So he goes to conferences and uh, does talk about benchmarks and, in general, against the big data hype. So. Let me just go if I can find, uh, there it is. Just a figure. Yeah, so what you see in this figure is, well, first of all, it doesn't start from zero. Take a note. And it, it is uh, model performance. I believe that's logistic regression, but uh, I don't uh, remember. From a different uh, size of data. So this is like 10,000, this is 10 million. So what's your, what's your training data? And this is area under curve. If you're not familiar with area under curve, that's a machine learning uh, model evaluation, which goes from 0 to, to 1, uh, or here from 0 to 100. So uh, what you can see here is uh, that pretty much those two, the green and the yellow on the top, this is Python and R, single, single machine, machine learning libraries. In R, it's uh, I'm not sure what goes with GLM for loglag, for example, in Python, scikit-learn. And those perform best. And then you see that there is H2O. H2O is a distributed machine learning library, uh, which, is, um, which is pretty good. You can also uh, use it on the top of Spark. So there is H2O, and there is something called Wappel Webit. I think it's also distributed, but actually I, I never use it. Uh, and here is Spark. So the only thing that you see here is the spark uh, is the one that's falling behind when it comes to model per, uh, performance. Now, the reason, well, most of the reason for that is that if you distribute machine learning algorithms, then in many cases, you need to, uh, you need to go and make some compromises about like, how uh, accurate you want to be versus how quick you want to be. So these distributed algorithms balance that. So for example, if you, do, uh, if, you do rig if you do decision trees, don't take my word on it, but I believe what's happening is that uh, for all continuous variables, the Spark and also the other distributed ones will just make some binning. Otherwise, all the communication between the nodes would be like super, would make it super, super slow. And because of these binnings, of course, you're losing some information. So uh, yeah, just take it with a pinch of salt. I would recommend you to use Spark for machine learning if you have that amount of data that you want to, um, that, you, that you cannot use in, in R or in Python. Or if you want to use the parallel capabilities of Spark, for example, for cross-validation or bootstrapping or doing things like that. So use it as a distributed system. OK, so let me go back. This was a disclaimer, but uh, I really believe that Spark is a, is a great solution. And uh, yeah, we use it a lot, mostly for classic ETL, so like data manipulation, and it, it really pays out. It's a great technology. OK, so let me come back here. This will be code heavy. If you are not familiar with writing or reading code, then try to get an intuition of it. Uh, otherwise, I will just explain uh, more or less what, what you see here. So if you work with Spark, then you always have this object called Spark. This is now a Python notebook. You see it up there. And uh, so you always have this Spark uh, object. If you use Zeppelin or some integrated environment, that's pre-created for you. Otherwise, you can just create it for yourself with some configuration. So here is Spark. And this is most probably the most advanced command that we will do because it's a low-level command. I'm just asking Spark how many CPU cores it has. 
And these are called, called slots in Spark. So we are having here on our cluster eight CPU cores in total. So that's like a small cluster. This is what you get for free if you use this environment. This is actually uh, a container on a EC2 instance. So it's like a, a part of a single virtual machine. So it's great for demonstration but, and prototyping, but you, you wouldn't use this for uh, the free version for, for doing actual production work. OK. So our data, our data is, is a bicycle uh, renting service. And they have a lot of data about an hourly data about uh, how was the weather, was it a weekday, what was, was the actual date, a few other features, and like how many bikes were rented. So we will just create a simple pipeline to show you how you can get this problem, train a machine learning model in Spark, and then predict bike rentals uh, based on the features. So this is our data. Uh, this is our data in a CSV file. Every time you see this uh, percentage FS, if you use Zeppelin, then you know that this is the magic sign. It just means that it's like a notebook, a, no a notebook uh, command. It's not a Spark command. So we are just checking, for example, now on the CSV. So you see that it's a CSV, uh, which is delimited by commas. It has a header and a few, uh, few features in there. We will get back to this. So let's just uh, load it. So this is how you load uh, a CSV in Spark. You just say Spark read, and then you say, I want to read something which has a header. I want you to infer the schema, and then this will be a CSV. And then I can cache and say, cache it right away. So keep it in the distributed memory of the cluster. So let me just go and execute this. And I will also say, like, create a table in Spark SQL, which pretty much means just create an alias in Spark SQL to this data frame that I created from this CSV, and I will call it bike rentals. So every time I want to execute SQL, like Spark SQL, I can just reference this thing uh, by saying bike rentals. OK, so that's easy. And you will see that these things uh, start pretty so these don't take too much time. Now we just went to the CSV. But it didn't really read it. It just inferred the schema. So let's just go and display this CSV. So this is what you see. Uh, it has an instant, which is an ID. It has a, a date, like a string date format. And then um, what's the season? Uh, what's the year? The year is 0 or 1, because it's years for two days. It's, it's pretty much prepared, this data. So 2011 and 2012, I believe. And it's represented by 0 or 1. Uh, what's the month? What's the hour? If it was a holiday or a big day, or which day? If it was a working day, uh, what? It's the weather, I forgot. But it's something with the weather is 0 or 1. What's the temperature? These are normalized data, uh, humidity, and all these things. Now, what matters for us here is really we have culture, registry, and count. Count is how many uh, bikes were rented. This is our label. And the culture and register are just really just how count is, that, uh, is uh, broken down. So it, was it someone with a card, like a club card, or someone who just walked in from the screen? So we won't actually need these two columns. So this is what we will use for our analytics here. And let's see how many rows. Is it will, you will see that it's certainly not big data. Uh, it's 17,000. Uh, 17, but you will see it's, it's great for demonstration here and for some rolling. So we will go now, pre-process the data, train a model, predict, evaluate, done. OK. So uh, if you work with the Spark API, that's pretty uh, intuitive. We will, we will deep dive into it tomorrow at the cafe. Now I really just want to be like kind of quick here. Uh, if you want to drop a few uh, columns, you're free to do that. We will drop the ID, which was instant, the string thing, because all, this, all the data information is extracted in integer columns. And if it's causal or registered, because we only care about the count, this will be the, the C and T will be our label. So we will, do, we will go and drop this. OK. Spark is immutable, which means that it never changes the data frame. You always need to reassign it to either the same object or, uh, or a new one. This is how it works. You are like, building your pipeline. So now we are having everything but, but these columns. So that was easy so far. Uh, 
if you're interested in the exact types, you can just check the schema. You'll see that now pretty much everything is either an integer or double. So the season, all these things are integers. Some of the doubles are labeled as an integer. That's cool. So we have numeric fields. Nothing needs to be encoded anymore. OK, so let's just go and uh, split the data into train and test. Um, is there anyone who doesn't know these concepts of train and test? Can I get a raise of hand? Like training data and test data? OK. Yeah, thanks. OK, like the two people. Thanks. <laughs> usually, you know, usually it's hard. If I ask, like, I assume that many of you know. So if I just ask who knows it, then I won't really see if anyone doesn't know. Otherwise, you get to be not shy. But OK, so if you don't know this, let me just um, explain it to you. I think I have a slide here exactly about that. There we go. So what we are going to do is called supervised learning. It will, like, let me just tell you, like a super high level overview of this thing. Supervised learning means you have historical data. You have your, the correct data points, like what you saw here. We had the CNT. We want to have CNTs for later, so we want to predict the CNTs, but we have historical data. We already know the good answer. So we take this data set, and intuitively what you would do, you train a model on this data set, and then you start predicting. But that's, if you train a model on your whole data set, you won't have any idea how good your model is. So you just put some data aside. This will be called the test. And you keep the training data, which is what you will build your model on. Now this test set is just a piece of the original one, so it still has the count. So when you create a model, you can go and make a prediction and just vary data against the test set. So you make a prediction on the test set, and you say, OK, this is how it should be, and this is what the model did. So you have a good idea about how good that is. So you get to split it into training and test. Usually you, uh, you put the most of the data for training. OK, so that's it in a nutshell. Uh, let me go back here. Oops. OK, that was here. So you're making a random split of this data. 70% will go for train, 30% for test. So these are not two new data frames, train and test. And you see that uh, it works pretty much. So these are the actual, uh, these are the actual numbers. All right. So let's just see how that works. So if you want to check this in, uh, in Spark, like do some aggregation, one thing you can do is use Spark SQL. So because if you remember in the beginning, we registered uh, this data frame as a bike rental, so we can just execute SQL on the top of it. And the Spark will pick that up, interpret it, and get the CSV read, and do all the things. So here is, by hour, what is the average rental? So this is simply uh, our data frame here. We can make a chart. That's a Databricks feature. If you use Zeppelin, uh, which is an open source notebook solution, you have also a charting feature there. But this is a notebook feature here. So this is how it looks. Perhaps if I go and click plot options and make a line chart, it makes more sense. Yeah. OK. So you can see uh, that it's like the beginning of classic office works day, uh, work hours when, when they uh, rent bikes or after work, right after. So this is, this is like the distribution of, uh, of how bikes are uh, rented. And this is what we are going to do here uh, is this will be our machine learning pipeline. And I try to be like very high level about it. First of all, we need for Spark, you need all these features. Now, features are everything which is not what you want to predict. So all the columns, you, want to, you need to put it in a single column in a vector. This is what there is a component called vector assembler. It will do that. Then, also you can tell Spark that all those columns which only have like one or two or three values, for example, the year, which is zero or one, it's an integer, but you don't want to take it as an integer because there is no relation between them. It's not like one is uh, so much bigger than zero or whatever. It's really just categories. So this vector indexer will do that for you automatically. So all the, all the values with only a few features, it will convert it into categorical values. And then we will uh, train a gradient boosted tree. 
a gradient boosted tree is a, is a set of decision trees. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of a modern model. If you want to win a Kaggle competition, then you, you got to use it. Uh, and yeah, it trains like hundreds of decision trees and then, then um, yeah, just, uh, just predicts based on that with a voting. Like, like to, to convert it, yeah. uh, you will see it. Uh, we will see it just in a minute. Okay. So, okay. So first of all, we need our feature columns. First, let's work on the vector assembler. So getting our feature vector. So what I'm doing here is really just getting the columns out from the the data frame and then removing the label column, which is the CNT. And um, this is all the rest that I'm having. So these are the columns that I will know every day when I want to predict how many bikes will be rented. So yeah, so let's just train our vector assembler. Our vector assembler, what it does, it, you can say that I will have a data frame. Our, the input columns will be these features columns. So all these columns, I want you to combine it into a single array. And this output column, you should call row features. So. I will just go and apply this vector assembler on the training data. This is what you see here. And then display, display the new data frame. So I just want to show you that this is what I'm having. I'm having an extra, extra feature, which is uh, called draw feature, just as I, I said, which has everything in it. So for example, here you see that this is the season, then the second one is the year, then the third one is the month, and so on. So it's really just, it's really just uh, assembled in a single vector. Now, if you are into machine learning, then there is also another thing uh, that's popping up. If you're uh, not, uh, not into like, the technical implementation, then don't worry about it. You see that there are a few dense vector representations like this, and there are a few sparse vector representations like this when the zeros are not stored. So these are just, Spark also uses two kinds of vector representation to, to save space. The dense, it's really just like, it represents a vector. The sparse, it just represents uh, it takes the vector, it says, hey, your vector is like a thousand long, and this is where you have non-zero values. So this is basically, if you have a lot of zeros, then it's a very uh, compressed representation of vector. This is, you also see it if you, if you take it home and take a look. Okay, so here is the, uh, that was our uh, vector assembler, and here is a vector uh, indexer. So we say input column will be the raw feature, so just use what we created. Then the output column should be features. And here is the answer for your question. The max categories should be four, which means that all the, all the columns that only have four or less values, distinct values, should be converted into categorical values and not left as numerical values. So this is the vector indexer. So keep in mind that we, what we did, we just created this, uh, these objects. We didn't really use it so far. I just gave you a demo about the vector assembler, but we will not use this vectorized features DF anymore. I just wanted to show it to you. So we are having these two objects, vector indexer, vector assembler. So let's just go and create this uh, GBT regressor. So this is the gradient boosted tree machine learning model. We say that the label that we want to use later is, uh, will be called CNT, and by default, it uses the features column called features. And you see that here we created this features column. So, okay, let's just go on and create the model. So this is something that, sorry, I just thought that I'm, I missed something. No, I won't, okay. So now we are just focusing on the GBT thing, not on the vector and the uh, vector, vector index and vector assembler. So just the machine learning part. Um, it's enough if you get the intuition of this. This is what we are saying. Hey, Spark, I don't know how deep, how deep of machine learning, uh, how deep of decision trees I want to train. Shall it be like three or five? Because I don't know which will predict better. I don't know either how many decision trees should this like, complex model contain. Perhaps 10 or perhaps 20. And you can create this so-called param grid, which is a standard machine learning concept. It's nothing uh, Spark specific. This is how you do it in Spark, and then Spark will figure out which combination of these four combinations that you can set up here is the best for, uh, for prediction. So 
this is the program grid builder and then you just say basically you say I want to evaluate my models then on root mean squared error if you don't know what root mean squared error is then uh, don't worry about it that's like a standard measure otherwise here this is the place where you where you specify your um, loss function so uh, you just say okay I want to evaluate my models based on this error function and then I will go and make a cross-validated one. Once again, we only have a little time. I will not talk about cross-validation. That's, that's again a technique to, uh, to kind of match up test and uh, train data inside. Tomorrow it will be, we will have more time, right? Yeah, tomorrow we will have much more. Exactly, yeah. So, okay, I will just execute this. Now another thing that Spark does is that it's lazy. It's lazy, it means that this will run like in 0 0.4 seconds. So it will say, Hey, okay, cool, okay, but I won't do anything unless you really tell me to do. So un unless you want to see something, I, I will just remember what you want to do. So the reason for that is that when you say something, like, hey, Spark, now, you do, now you, I really need to see the result, then Spark will say, okay, let's just see these 50 things that you wanted to do. I can optimize it like this and this and this. So it really just remembers what you want to do so it can optimize it later. Okay, so this is, uh, now we created this. So we will finish with the evaluation soon. So I will show you, for those of you who don't know a decision tree, there is a great introduction uh, of uh, decision trees. And it's called R2D3. If you Google R2D3, that's, that's an amazing thing if you ever want to have like a really a good intuition about how decision trees work. Now, here, is, uh, here are a few things. <coughs> this will take... Uh, this demo will take two parameters, like two, uh, it will take two data sets. One house is from San Francisco, other one house is from New York. And both of them have an evaluation. San Francisco will be the green, New York will be the, uh, the blue. And you will see that in San Francisco it's pretty hilly, so in the data set there are like high houses, like high uh, houses in a, a high elevation and uh, in New York is pretty flat. So this is the data, so let's see that we want to do something, uh, some prediction. We want to predict based on how high a house is uh, located and also on the price per square meter if it's a San Francisco house or a New York house. So this is what, this is what we see here. If it's if it's high, it's San Francisco, that's cool. If it's super expensive, that's New York, that's cool. <laughs> but what do we do with that? Right? So that's the, that's the question. In these kinds of programs, uh, problems, uh, decision trees uh, can be a good solution to use. And this is how they work. Uh, uh, let me just go and go this. They will find, they will, they will go and create a histogram on here the uh, elevation of the houses and try to find a place where, where they can be split pretty well. So when they can say that everything below, let's, let's say that's New York, everything uh, above, <coughs> let's say the San Francisco. And you can, you can play a bit with that. So for example, if you put it pretty high, then you will say that every time something is higher than this, I will just say San Francisco, I will get everything completely right. But everything that's like here, I will be like super inaccurate, like 63% accurate. So perhaps this is not the best. Uh, so it will just go and find a better one. Uh, okay, this is another extreme. If you just take everything, so this is pretty naive. You say all the time, it's San Francisco. That's the simplest machine learning model you can get. Still 56% correct. <laughs> everything San Francisco. So. There are, there are concepts like information gain and, and like machine learning concepts that, that you can use to find like the perfect split here. So um, then you start building an actual decision tree. So this is a decision tree uh, example. So where do you see it? Okay, you see it here. So it will say, which is the feature uh, of this data set which splits the data the best? Let's say it says elevation. So it will just find this point and we'll say, okay, everything which is smaller than that goes here, everything which is higher than that goes there. And it, it's recursive, it, it continues. It will check what is the next one. You cannot see it here on the, uh, on the projector, but this is price per uh, square meter, and this is, uh, this is like the absolute price. 
So they say everything which is high, the next best predictor is absolute price for the other one, price per square meter. And it will go and just really create uh, something, like really just like a bunch of if and else at the end. So if you say uh, there is something, like you, you edit a new, uh, a new set of parameters, if you just say, what is the elevation, what is the price, oh, it's high, okay, so what's the price again, okay, what is the year built, and it will go down to a certain one. It says, hey, that's New York. So this is great in theory, but what happens is that this is what you, when you uh, train it with, the, with, the, with your train data, everything will be perfect, but then you take your independent test data and of course it won't be that perfect because you're having some unseen, uh, some unseen records here. So that won't be that perfect. Usually what, uh, what people do with decision trees is that they just uh, go and one thing they do is that they limit the, the depth. So they say this is over specifying things. So let's just cut, cut all the things here. And if, you, if I take this, this should be the color which is the majority of all these colors, like down. All right, so this is decision trees in a nutshell. And I just, I just wanted to show you this because here, this is what we are doing. We are saying what should be the maximum depth, where should we cut the decision trees? This is max depth, max iteration once again. This is a complex model of many, many decision trees. How many decision trees to create for, for one a gradient boosted model? So Spark will find out this. So let's just go and uh, put everything in a pipeline. Now, if you watch so far, we haven't used this vector assembler and vector indexer really. We just created these objects. So now we will tell uh, Spark that now I want to create a pipeline. If you work with scikit-learn, that's something similar. Everything that I give you, first apply vector assembler, then apply vector indexer, then apply this whole thing that we created up there. So we will create this pipeline, we will call it pipeline, and then we can tell Spark that, hey Spark, just learn. So now it's fit, it will take a while because this is a sophisticated model. And these are Spark jobs, so if you want to go and uh, want to uh, debug it, you, you can see like all these jobs here. If I just click one of it, then you see how these jobs look like. This is all part of open source Spark, so there is like nothing data brick specific here. If you download Spark, you get the same. Uh, you can see like, most probably you, need, you get to be an engineer or, and, and spend a lot of time with Spark to, to, to get something. But this is how Spark executed this thing. So you can actually go and analyze this. Um, you can get like low level metrics, like for example, how many tasks, what is the garbage collection time. So if you want to debug a Spark application and tune it on your cluster, that's a good place to, to see. Also here you can see Spark storage, which is, uh, I'm not sure what I can show you here, but this is a Spark storage, what it keeps in memory. So for example, you can see that it keeps some one, one, uh, one megabyte data in memory. It's not replicated anywhere. So you can see like the internal workings of Spark, but that's something that you can control. All right, and you see that we are already past like a thousand iterations. So this will finish in a, in a few seconds, hopefully. Okay, there we go. Now here is one thing, uh, and I really don't want to sugarcoat Spark here. So this, this uh, finished in 1.50, uh, 1.5 minutes, one and a half minutes. If you have that small amount of a data set, most probably if you use R or Python or something, in a few seconds you get, you get this. So Spark really pays out when it comes to machine learning if you, if you need to scale out. So the good thing is that Python at one point will run out of memory. If you add computer to a Spark cluster, it will still scale up pretty, uh, pretty well. Okay, so let's go and make some predictions. Here we are having, oh sorry, let me go back. So we are having now this pipeline model. This pipeline model is the one that we can use for making predictions. Uh, we take our test data set and just uh, transform it. Transforming means make a prediction. So now I'm having a new data frame with the predictions <coughs> included. Predictions are pretty uh, quick to make. It's always a learning that's, that's, uh, that takes a long time. 
So here I'm having the prediction. So let's just select the count and the prediction and, and everything else. So he, this is how our prediction went on. Well, you will see that it's like uh, mildly successful. So <laughs> for example, 25, 33 perhaps good, but this 3, 28. Yeah, you, you get to evaluate it, right? It was just a vanilla run, really. Uh, but if I go down, you also see that, I just found this this morning, that if you, if you want to make like a pretty standard uh, optimization is you can just cut it at zero, for example. It also predicted like minus nine bikes going rented when two are rented. So, yeah. So this is really just a naive approach, but you saw like how this whole thing works. Uh, and if I just go and take the, uh, the, if I evaluate this model with the root mean squared error, then you see that the average error is 60, which is pretty high for a, a service. So, so, so you got to work a lot on it, right? Usually if you see like deep learning demos, then this is not what's happening, right? Someone comes in, hey, we are having 12 minutes. Okay, <laughs> these are like 1 million data points and images to who is James Bond or whatever, and then it's like everything works well. Now, this is not happening here, uh, so not in production. Um, okay, so let's just check how the predictions relate to, uh, to the actual uh, values. So here is just select, we just, I just select the predictions from the R, the count, and the actual prediction. And let me go on and visualize this. So if I visualize that, I go to plot options here. Then I can say I want to aggregate it with an average, and I have the keys at the R, and then the prediction versus count, just make a line chart. And then apply, you see that, okay, it's not that horrible. <laughs> so this is like predictions versus count. Now, uh, sorry. <laughs> okay, now that's 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 really it. So that's that's like a broad topic. I just wanted to push it into a a, a really short time. Um, this is how you can use it. Once again, just uh, drop us a line, and and I can give you this notebook. You can also download the original notebook from from uh, from Databricks. But this, this notebook that we cooked, uh, we can give it to you, of course. And if, you, if you're coming tomorrow at the Data Science Cafe, then well, there is a good news and a bad news. The bad news is that we will not cover machine learning because you know you will be people who never work with Spark. So we want to make it to machine learning in two hours. But we will have a pretty much deep dive about understanding the basics, how you can work with data in Spark. So after the cafe, most probably you can go home and just hit up the machine learning documentation or just understand this notebook fully. Okay, guys, so uh, that was pretty much it, and thank you very much. So if, uh, if, you, still have any, if you have any questions, then I'm happy to take a few, <coughs> if we have time. It, just, yes? Just a really quick one to the methodology. Um, how can a decision tree predict negative values when you don't have uh -huh, yeah, is that's a great idea. Or, uh, how is it really yeah, I don't know. That's a great <laughs> question. <laughs> right? I, and why would you use a decision tree on such thing? You would. You can use a gradient. We use a gradient tree regressors. They are they are pretty good. So they are pretty effective usually. Okay. So I think I think that's something that what you would do. You can try this and you can logistic uh, try like linear regression or whatever uh, on that. Uh, so that was just one choice. It, it could have worked out, but yes, I, I will look that up, but I have no idea now that you're saying how it can like, go really offshore. If, if there is, a, if there, is there anyone who has an, uh, an answer for that? How can a decision tree provide a value which is like far away? So come to the data science cafe tomorrow, there will be the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we will look that up. Yeah, thanks for the question, yeah. Yeah, but this is already, this is average of all hours. So this is not record-based data. So we just average it by hour, that's why. All right, if no more questions, then hopefully we see a lot of you tomorrow at the cafe. Thanks. <laughs>